so will the FOMC cut next month? Well, it's too early to front run that decision for the meetings coming up in three to four weeks. And I'm actively considering all possibilities, thinking about the global economy, the domestic economy, and importantly, numbers on inflation for the U.S. But what is there in uh, the data that you see right now that would warrant an interest rate cut, especially the domestic data that you are receiving? So right now we see a domestic economy that's that's really solid. We have strong consumer spending, consumer confidence numbers came out uh, good, healthy. And the weakness that we're seeing is all in business investment. It's weighed down by global slowdown and also the considerable uncertainty that we face for a variety of reasons. So I'm looking carefully at business investment, talking to my business contacts, finding out what their plans are for going forward, and seeing if the economy needs some additional stimulus in order to achieve our dual mandate goals, full employment and price stability. And that's just something which we have at the moment. We are seeing very little evidence of you needing to do this, but the trade war has changed the game, has it not, Mary? And how much of that is impacting and preying on your mind as to not what's happening now or what's happened a month ago, but what's going to happen, let's say, in two to three months from now? And is that really where the debate is centred? So for me, the way I look at it is we've had this ongoing uncertainty. It's been over a year since these trade discussions have been have emerged. And it's like a strong wind blowing. I'm in Wellington. It's a windy city. You're always getting a wind blowing on you from this uncertainty. And sometimes it gusts and sometimes it just settles to a strong wind. And what I'm really paying attention to is are the winds picking up or are we simply getting these periodic gusts? And in how will those winds affect business investment? So that's what I'm really looking at. The other part of what I'm looking at that gets missed sometimes because of the trade discussions is that inflation in the United States has been underrunning our 2% goal for over seven years. And we need to be thoughtful about achieving not only our full employment mandate, but also our inflation mandate. Disinflation is a global issue, is it not, Mary? And does monetary policy still have any efficacy in dealing with it? That's the big question, I'm supposing. Well, it does have efficacy still. And you can see, if you look down into the data, that as the economy has maintained a solid pace of growth above our trend, then we've seen gradual uptick in, in inflation, especially the cyclical components of inflation. Now, when some of these idiosyncratic factors that push inflation down temporarily roll off, my expectation is inflation will continue to move back to target. Well, Mary, inflation is undershot for a long time now. Does it still make sense to have that 2% target in the first place? Absolutely. So we took on a 2% target after a long number of discussions, largely because we need a buffer, a buffer from being too close to zero. And we know what happens if you have disinflation. And also, we need policy space. Remember, our nominal interest rate is the real rate of interest, which is slower and lower than it was in the past, plus inflation. So every tenth or two we lose on inflation, we lose on nominal interest rates, and we ultimately lose on policy space should the next downturn arise. Mary, Ali, you talked about how it's still too early to decide if a rate cut is necessary at this point in time. Uh, Bill Dudley, your former colleague, uh, came out to say that perhaps it could be ineffectual. In fact, additional stimulus could, could, be, could, be, could do more harm than good. Your take and your response to that. Well, I'm not going to comment on that. I know that's the topic of the day, but I'm not going to comment on that. I will tell you how I'm thinking about it. When I look over the out among out into the future, I see challenges that we're facing globally and, and domestically. The domestic economy in the U.S. is very solid, but we have these headwinds blowing against us. And part of that's uncertainty, part of it's slower global growth. And we have to factor in how those headwinds are going to affect our ability to achieve full employment and price stability. So again, I'm looking at all of those factors and seeing how they're going to weigh on the U.S. economy and then considering my decision is how to offset any of those headwinds so that we can attain uh, sustainable growth. The question really is whether the Fed should 
be mitigating the headwinds that we're talking about here? I'm going to talk about my views on, on what the Fed is meant to do. We have two congressionally mandated goals, price stability and full employment. And we consider those goals for the American people absent any political conversation, uh, considerations. When I go th over the threshold of the FOMC room, all I think about is the American people and the congressionally mandated goals. And I take those decisions quite seriously. In your view, Mary, are the Fed's tools enough to mitigate the headwinds? We have tools that allow us to sustain the expansion. We've shown that. And we have tools that we can deliver to continue to achieve the goals that we've been given. So I believe that we have the tools to do our job. President Trump increasingly voicing his opinions. How should the Fed take politics into account when making a decision on whether to raise rates or not? So I'll tell you how I approach my job as a policymaker. I do not consider political issues. I consider only the congressionally mandated goals that we've been given. And when I approach my job, those are the things I'm thinking about. And I'm looking at the data, the models, the evidence. I'm talking to businesses and community leaders and my colleagues. And I'm coming to conferences like I attended here in New Zealand. And I'm putting all of that information together to undertake the best decision for the American people. And political considerations never enter in. Mary, tell me something here. Of course, you may need signs of stimulus in, in, in the future, maybe as soon as uh, next month. Now, the thing is, how much of that do you think should not come from monetary policy, but from the fiscal side as well? Well, if you think more broadly than just today, you think about the future we face over the next decade, we are going to have to put many of our best tools to work to ensure that we can continue to sustain economic growth, given that we are very close to the zero lower bound in most countries. That zero lower bound is closer than it has been historically. We have low R star and persistently weak inflation and slower growth because of structural factors like demographic changes and uh, slower productivity growth. So all of those things call for us to align our resources and basically row in the same direction to ensure that we can continue a sustained expansion, not only domestically in the United States, but globally. Now, Mary, you just made a speech there in Wellington, and you'll be talking about the new deep parameters of central banking. Tell us about that. So the new deep parameters, as I've called them, in economics we like to call things deep parameters. They're like the fundamental things we rely on. And the new deep parameters, if you will, is the growth in the U.S. Let me use the U.S. as an example. We used to think of it as 3.5% for potential growth. Now it's something on the order of 2 little bit less than two. We used to think that the neutral rate of interest was three and a half percent. Now the neutral rate of interest is 0.5 by the latest, the median of the summary of economic projections at the FOMC. These are things that are really fundamentally different and call for us to be thoughtful about whether our frameworks and our tools that we've used historically are exactly the right ones that we should use going forward. Uh, Mary, I want to touch on the dollar strength. The world is watching it, President Trump watching it really like a hawk as well. What do you make of the strength of the dollar? Is it causing a problem for not just the U.S. economy, but the global economy as well? So the dollar fluctuates, as we know, based on economic conditions in countries, relative economic strength. And so that is an outcome of the fact that the economies are differently um, they're, they're playing out differently. They have different strengths. So we don't make policy for the dollar. That's not the role. That's not my role. But when you think about why currencies fluctuate with each other, it's because of the strength of the relative economic outlooks. Are you comfortable with where the dollar is right now? I don't make any comments on dollar policy. The Fed doesn't make dollar policy. That's the Treasury's decision. But Mary, President Trump has come out to say that he wants a weaker dollar, and there's a sense out there that perhaps there could be dollar intervention 
perhaps soon. Uh, what are the implications of dollar intervention? So think about dollar and other financial conditions. All of these are just part from the federal, from my perspective in my role. These are just part of the financial conditions that we assess and then we make decisions about those financial conditions and how they're playing out in the economy, just like we look at the real economy and inflation and other variables. So for me, those are inputs into a decision, not outputs from a decision. Mary, I want to just get to the, that dual mandate again, inflation and full employment here. Now, if the normal trade-off like the Phillips curve used to do, uh, the, t the normal tension between unemployment and inflation has weakened or even uh, broken down in terms of a correlation, how do you know that you've achieved your a full employment mandate and where does that then leave the neutral rate for the cost of borrowing so let's talk about full employment first if you think the normal tension and, and it's clear it has uh, between unemployment and inflation has weakened then finding full employment is more challenging than it has been in the past when there was a tighter relationship so one way that I do it is I talk to business leaders and people who own businesses and hire workers. And I talk to workers and I look at the data in combination with that to see where really full employment is. The way I, I think about it is full employment we used to think was the cement wall that we couldn't break through because something really negative would happen and now we're finding that it's a little more flexible than we thought and we can really bring in additional workers and help people skill up and move up in the economies that they're a part of. In terms of the neutral rate of interest, those are different concepts. The neutral rate of interest is determined by you know, population savings and investment demand and productivity growth and population aging, essentially. And what we, where we are now, we're roughly in line with the neutral rate of interest on the funds rate in the U.S. Okay, I would just have a look at what bond markets globally is saying. We've got a third of the globe now seeing something like 16 trillion dollars worth of debt in negative terrain what is that telling you and what pressures does it put on the 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 treasury market as well and what in turn do you look at that and what do you take from that so it's clear that we are in a time where, in, in the United States anyway, the yield curve is flattened and inverted at some frequencies. And so this is, this is something that we pay careful attention to. But there's a variety of factors that are affecting that at this point. So one possibility and one thing that is likely there is that the long run views on growth are really coming into clarity among market participants that's going to be slower. These new deep parameters are really becoming part of what people talk about. So growth will be slower in the future than it has been in the past. Another thing that's happening, though, is that the inflation risk premium is falling. Inflation rates are coming down in many countries. They've been low for a long time in, in the U.S., below target. And so that's just going to reduce the inflation premium. And the risk premium is also falling, the, the, the risk you're, you're willing to take on, that term premium. So. Finally, there's this, there's this flight to safety, a flight to a rate of return. And so you see that, that all affecting the yield curve in the United States and affecting financial markets more generally. Which one of those on any particular day is the most important is, is not easy to tell. But I do believe that all of those are affecting what the, the financial markets in general look like. Uh, Mary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has come out to say that the U.S. is seriously considering issuing ultra-long bonds. Your thoughts on that? I mean, this has been considered many times before, but it's been put to rest because it's not great for taxpayers. That is uh, the understanding. What's your take on the Fed rethinking ultra-long bonds? Well, I think that that's a decision that they're considering, and I will leave it to them to, to look at those the academic papers and think about the impacts of those types of things. I mean, you, went, you asked a question earlier about what are fiscal sides of the House and monetary policy sides of the House in all countries doing, and I think one of the things people are doing is thinking about how do we deal with the new world we have with the tools that we've been given. But the issue really is funding debt deficits at really low cost. What are the dangers of that? I mean, going forward, what are the risks you see? Well, anytime you take up 
debt, you always have to consider how you will pay it and how you will pay it back and what will change in the future. But right now, the fundamental issues that we're facing across the globe and in the U.S. is how do we ensure that the economy continues to grow and how do we, in the U.S. anyway, how do we make fundamental investments in our infrastructure and our human capital so that we can continue to, to grow and expand in the future? Mary, tell me something. What about that uh, Fed rate hike we had in December? Was that a mistake? Do you think the Fed was too, uh, should I say, hawkish for too long? My judgment, I supported the rate hike in December. And the reason was this, that if you looked at the data coming in up until that time, the economy was growing above trend. It was projected to grow above trend in 2019 and even in 2020. Inflation was moving back up to target. The labor market was looked extremely tight. And we were below the neutral rate of interest. So we were stimulating the economy when we had those conditions. Subsequent to that increase, that rate hike, then what we saw was that the data, the mood and the data were becoming more um, pessimistic, if you will, more a little bit softer, the data a little softer, the mood a little more pessimistic. And that's partly because that strong headwind I was talking about, it intensified. It wasn't just a gust that went away. The, the whole wind got got stronger. And that blew against us. And, and these types of things, global slowing, the, the headwinds from uncertainty, those things weigh on the economy. The neutral rate of interest has been coming down a little bit. And so to recalibrate policy, that's uh, why I supported the July uh, 25 basis point cut, to recalibrate policy, to put the economy back in a good position. Back to where it was before the, uh, the, uh, the stance on monetary policy. Uh, but tell me something as well, uh, Mary, here. And this is a question actually from my colleague David Ingles, and that is if the ECB recalibrates and decides to re-enter re -enter quantitative easing, what do you take away from that, and what's your reaction to it? So all central banks are responding to the fact that they've got economic conditions that are changing. So in Europe, in the European Union, the economic conditions have slowed quite a bit and inflation's under the target. And so that requires central banks to take action and, and they're doing that. In the United States, we also look out at our economy. We see how the global factors affect us and we have to take our interest rate decisions based on what we see for, for the domestic economy. Uh, Mary, there's a sense out there that uh, central banks are being held hostage by the markets. The more central banks do, the more the markets want. Is this the new normal? Are you comfortable with how it's panning out? Well, markets are move day to day. They fluctuate. They're finding their own footing. And some of that is based on the outlook that they have for the economy. And some of it's based on just trying to figure out what's coming next from, from uh, central banks. And what I do is I take market information, financial conditions more generally, as an input. Financial conditions being tighter or softer or, or, or easier would influence how stimulative the economy is, how well-supported growth is. So I take that as an input, but it's not a determining factor in my decision making. Is there a sense that central banks around the world could be running on empty soon. We had the RBNZ cutting 50. The RBA is saying it could be close to zero. Are you concerned? Not at the moment. I'm a, we're in some countries, we're a little closer to the end of policy space to the effective lower bound than than we'd like or that I would like. In the U.S., we have policy space available. We still have the rate you know, high enough that we have additional stimulus that we could bring to bear. But one of the great lessons from the, the GFC, the global financial crisis, was that we have a variety of tools that we can bring to bear to solve problems when problems appear. And so I'm not, um, I'm confident that we can continue to deploy those tools and that we can in the United States provide the stimulus necessary to to uh, achieve our dual mandate goals. Mary, last question, final question here. What do you worry about the most out there? I worry about the mood getting ahead of the data. If you look at the data you see in the US and in other countries, 
New Zealand as an example. In, in, in the U.S., though, let me speak to that, you see the data coming in pretty solidly. Consumers are confident. Consumer spending is solid. Business investment is slowing, weighed down by uncertainty, of course, but it's still it's not negative. It's not disinvesting. We still have growth. And so I worry that those against those good data, the mood of uncertainty, of concerns about the future, I hear many times that, well, we've in the U.S., we've been expansion for 10 years. Doesn't it run out of gas at some point? That all of these moods will actually get ahead of the data and it could become a self-fulfilling prophecy, one that actually makes it harder for us to sustain the expansion and achieve our goals.